can't really be in this landscape without seeing witches everywhere. The legend and the folklore of the witches is still very powerful in these parts. So I decided, alongside John Clayton, the local historian and author, to restart the witch hunt for Malkin Tower, which has been lost for 400 years. This dig is part of our community archaeology project, and we're working with consultants from Northern Archaeological Associates. The project, in essence, is to see if we can discover where one of the people that are alleged to be a witch live one of the, the Demdikes, one of the famous witches in the, the witchcraft story. We're hoping to find the evidence of the house and artifacts from that period and begin to understand the material culture of the time period and how that might relate to witchcraft and that kind of thing. The dig is five weeks. We have students from all over the U.S. and two from Canada and then four UCLan students from Preston. So it's a international project. We get breakfast, we begin digging from 9 to 4, we get a lunch break and then we go home and try to relax as much as we can before the next dig. We do a little bit of yoga, loosen up the joints, but really we're just all excited to be digging in the dirt. So that, like That's one of our favorite parts is just to dig and then to find an artifact on top of that is just icing on the cake for sure. I'm local, born and raised in Burnley. I've been a commercial archaeologist for 10 years. Working on a, a student excavation like this is a nice change of pace. We started on Monday deturfing by hand and then trowel cleaning and then with the division of the site into the sections each student's got their own little area to work in and the idea is that they're reducing it systematically in small spits taking it down to the natural where hopefully we'll start to see some archaeological features coming through. Essentially there's a lot of different things happening. We're using texture so when you have different soil you're going to be able to roll it and feel it so if it's silty it's gonna fly away and be essentially dust. If it's got clay you're gonna be able to roll it if it's loam, you're going to be able to feel how damp it is and how much moisture is in the soil. And we kind of, in archaeology, have a couple different soil types that we can differentiate between. Then there's also color. So we have something called a Munsell chart, where essentially we're using very uh, specific gradients to find the different colors in the soil, as well as having a basic understanding of different kinds of rocks. Well, my role has basically been to oversee the students working, trying to let them do the bulk of the actual physical work. They're the ones learning after. After all, I'm there to field questions on what people may have found or how best to approach the, the next stage of digging. So we're on our hands or knees with our trowels and we use that to scrape off that topsoil, loosen it up and we try to be very careful so that if we run into any artifacts like pottery or the broken pipes that we won't break them. And so if we see them, we'll pull them out and put them in evidence bags, but that loose topsoil we put into buckets and we go on over to the sifters and we sift through it um, just to make sure we didn't miss anything and just to make sure that we comb through all the evidence that we can before we move on to the next level. The most common form of the question is how can you tell the difference between pottery and say a flat bit of stone or we've been getting little bits of work flint which is a bit of a specialism of mine so I've been talking them through how you can tell that that flint has been worked and struck. What could be natural might be foreign to you and you might get excited over it but it could just be an everyday pebble so understanding the difference between uh, what is kind of important like the Neolithic flint that we were finding that's fairly important versus ordinary sandstone. They're generally learning about archaeology in its entirety, so what it's like to be an archaeologist as much as how we actually do the work and what we do. We know there's things here. We don't know necessarily what they are or how old they are, but we know there are archaeological features in this field. Got a school group in, finding out what's involved in a small archaeological excavation, what the archaeologists are finding, the stories behind it, and why we've decided to do an excavation here and hopefully if they're interested now they might continue that interest in the future. One of the things we had not done here before we ever dug a hole at all was my colleague uh, Mike Woods from Manchester Metropolitan University carried out a resistivity survey which looks at the variation in the electrical resistance of the soil and that tells you basically where there are features on the ground. Well the first thing we did was look at uh, John Clayton's historical evidence to whittle down the possible size for Malkin Tower and then we provided geophysical survey with two different types of machine. We did both the electrical resistance and the magnetometry over that field there where we found the evidence of what appear to be previous structures in the field which is now what is being excavated. On the basis of his survey, we put the trench in in the middle because it looked to be over an area where there were lots of features associated with what looked like a rectangular building. 
At the top of the field, there was another anomaly, another feature showing on that survey, which is close to a gable end, which survives in the dry stone wall around the field. So we may have two different buildings. We may have two buildings at two different dates. So far, all the finds from the trench at the south end of the field on the timber building are of 19th century day, but I'm not too worried about that because we've proved that building is earlier than the 19th century. At the other end, by the gable end and the north end of the field, there are loads of finds and most of those are 17th or 18th century styles. If we're right, then we should see something like a building which is about 8 metres wide and 20 metres long up there, which would have functioned both as a house and as a barn. And it might have been built in the late medieval period and continued to be occupied right through until the 18th century. We don't know for certain which particular location was the site of, for example, the, the Sabbath that was reported in Thomas Potts' account. But to be honest, that doesn't really matter because to find archaeological understandings behind that period and that time, what we need to do is we need to excavate the rural settlements people living in in the 17th century. So that site is earlier than the early 19th century. Lots of early pottery up there. There's lots of evidence for structures up there. It's really good evidence to give us that background to the witch trials. It doesn't matter if it's not actually where Elizabeth Southerns lived. I think the best we could come out of this with would be to say, right, we know there is a house at the right day on Malkin Tower Farm. Therefore, Malkin Tower Farm becomes a very strong contender for the site of Malkin Tower. Well, we've been looking at this area for a good 15 years with history on this site going back to 13th century easily, right, right through to the 16th, 17th century. So to marry the record into something in the ground is great. We had uh, information from folklorists of uh, local tradition that there was something at the top of this hill, so we thought we would check it out. You have to kind of uh, wade through the folklore and legend to be able to pinpoint it and then um, excavate with the archeological science to attempt to prove the theories. We've found pretty much what we were looking for, or what we were hoping for. When we came, we found the evidence of two buildings. One is probably a timber frame crook building. The other is a more substantial, possibly a stone building with fire that has been applied to it, either purposely or in, uh, by accident. What we think with this building is it's not a dwelling because there's not that much in the way of objects in here. It's very clean. So I'm thinking that either it's somewhere that was lived in by people, but the other end of the building was a barn and had animals in it, and we've got the end that's got the animals in it, or it was just purely an agricultural building. Up on the top of the hill on the north end, we've got more evidence, much more evidence of settlement. What we've got here is a really good example of, of the common man and the common woman in Pendle Forest, which is really unusual. You usually get the, uh, the gentry and the large landowners. With archaeology, you're never going to get an absolute you know, smoking gun that says, or very rarely, that says this is identified to a particular historical event. But it shows us what sort of dwelling was here at the right time. And with the place name evidence and the historical evidence, we can be fairly confident that this is the place um, where the Sabbath took place. Today is one of our community days. We've had two of these now. So in addition to educating our students, we've educated some of the local people on what archaeology is and the tangibility of it. It's been quite surreal, really. This year. You see how it slowly develops and opens up, and you see all these different features appearing. And just little things that you don't imagine, you know, what a postal looks like at the very start, and you go, well, I can't understand what you mean. And then, yeah, slowly it starts to appear. It's, it's been fascinating. We come up here and always we get asked where is Malkin Tower because it's part of the well-known story. I've always been brought up with the history or the myth of the, the Pendle witches. My dad was always into it as with my grandparents. To actually come and see it, it just allows you to make it that much more real. The more we can fill that gap between the, the medieval and the early modern where with very few buildings, if any, in, in the certainly in Pendle Forest, we can start to fill that gap as it's filling the, um, the historical uh, record. What they found in both the, the locations is fascinating. I've heard of Malkin Tower, I've read about Malkin Tower, and I know this is Malkin Tower Farm, but to see something which may be bringing it to life is absolutely fantastic. It's certainly looking good, and, and if I do believe it's going to go onwards this day, becomes an annual one, then you should really start to put the thing to bed. What I've learned this morning on this tour is really very interesting because it does start to say, well, whatever it was, there is something here on this Malkin farm site and uh, just adds to Thomas Potts' account. Well, the archaeology gives it a tangibility that these might be places where actual people actually live, so that's very important. They've also found uh, 
almost like a perfect circle at the very corner of the field this week. So we need to have a look at that. That could possibly be a, a kiln or something like that, or you know, was that a tower? We don't know. That's one of the things we'll find out next year. In terms of the legacy for us over the next year, it will be about creating interpretation, display boards, events, and taking them to the villages, the towns, to show people what was done here and how that can work into the local stories, into local history and the local archaeological records as well.